topic of isomers can be quite challenging. There's a lot of different terms and definitions to remember. And I just wanted to illustrate the concepts around isomers in a slightly different way, a bit more of a fun way. I'm sure that you've seen it in class or in your textbook being illustrated with molecular models, which is great. But I wanted to illustrate it with something a bit more fun. So I've got some Lego minifigures here to help me out. And these are going to stand in for molecules. I'm going to demonstrate the concepts around isomers using these guys and girls. So the first thing we need to decide when we're looking at molecules in terms of isomers is are these molecules isomers or are they just different compounds? So if they're isomers, the rule is they must have the same molecular formula, which means they must be built up of the same building blocks or atoms. So for example, all compounds that are C6H10 are isomers because they have the same molecular formula. Now, if we look at all of these figures, then the ones that are isomers are, well, these mariachimers, except for this one that doesn't have a guitar. These ones that have the mad scientist goggles and the pink potion. These uh, fairy Lego Batman, except for the one that doesn't have a wand. So he's missing a, an element, so he... Um, he doesn't, he's not an isomer of the other ones, and so on. So let's just pair this back to a set of, of uh, minifigures that are isomers. Okay, so let's look at the next step in classifying compounds into isomers. So here we've got our mad scientist again, and there's four different versions of them here. And what we need to do is work out whether these are isomers. Yes, they all have the same things connected, but they're connected in a different way. So they're isomers. If they are molecules that have the same molecular formula as Lego, they have got the same Lego pieces. Now, the first step of classifying isomers is, do we have the same atoms bonded to each other in the same arrangement or the same connectivity? So connectivity, isomers that have different connectivity are called constitutional isomers. So this one, is connected differently to this one and they're connected differently to these two but these two are connected in the same way we've got the potion or the solution connected in the hand we've got the head all connected together properly legs down the bottom and so on so i'm going to put one of those aside for for now and just focus on these three so we've got three different connectivities and that term the constitutional isomers if you need a mnemonic to help you remember this, think of these Lego figures and think about this mad scientist and how he must have to have a really tough constitution to be able to survive having a potion in the middle of his head or having his legs moved on top of his head and his torso touching the ground. So he's got a really tough constitution to survive these kind of changes in the way he's connected. So let's look at the next step of classifying isomers. Here we've got four versions of this mad scientist and these are not constitutional isomers he's got the same connectivity he's got the potion in the hand and he's got his head connected to his shoulders where it should be but there are different three-dimensional arrangement of the parts of his body and that of the things that he's holding so in the case of molecules there would be a different three-dimensional arrangement of the atoms but the same connectivity of the atoms so when we have that situation, a different three-dimensional arrangement, but the same connectivity, then we call that stereoisomers. So if you need a mnemonic for that, you might want to think, well, he's got his ears in the right place, so he can listen to a stereo, okay? Anyway, maybe you can come up with a better mnemonic. So once we've got to the stage of stereoisomers, we need to further classify those. So there's two types of stereoisomers. There's the ones that can be interconverted by rotating around single bonds and then the, then there's the ones that can't be interconverted that way so if i look at these examples uh, these two can't be interconverted by rotating bonds it doesn't matter how much i rotate around one of these hands or arms i'm not going to be able to get that flask in the same hand as on the other guy okay and same with this guy he can't get that flask Past his, past his body there. However, 
This one here, if we look at him, we just have to rotate his head, rotate the flask, and now we've got the same isomer as this one. So when we can just interconvert two stereoisomers via single bonds to get from one to another, then they're called conformational isomers or conformers. So the way I like to think about this in terms of a mnemonic is that this guy, he really feels a pressure to conform. When he's twisted out of sorts, got his head pointing the wrong way and trying to drink the potion, then he feels a real pressure to conform to society's expectations. And so he's a conformational isomer. Conformational isomer, he feels the pressure to conform. All right, let's get rid of one of these. This one here. So the three remaining stereoisomers here are not conformational isomers because we can't just rotate around single bonds to get between one and another. So these are called configurational isomers. And the mnemonic I'd like you to think about for this is that he's having real trouble trying to convert himself between one form and the other. He just can't figure it out. So he's a configurational isomer. He can't figure out how to get between one state and the other. So configurational isomers are a category of isomers, a category of stereoisomers, that often get a little bit neglected in many OCHEM courses. So your professor or your textbook may not even talk about configurational isomers, but according to the IUPAC rules, whenever we have stereoisomers where we can't interconvert through rotation around single bonds, they're configurational isomers, and then they further get subdivided into enantiomers and diastereomers, and I'm sure that you've heard about those if you've covered stereochemistry in your course. So how do we know whether we have enantiomers or diastereomers? So we're down to our last two categories now. Enantiomers are where we have mirror image compounds, mirror image Lego minifigures in this case, that aren't superimposable. So we can't superpose these two, but they're mirror images. So that's enantiomers. And then diastereomers are where we have stereoisomers, where they're not mirror images, but they're also not conformational isomers. So I can't rotate around single bonds to convert this one into this one. So they're a type of configurational isomer, but they're not enantiomers. And so diastereomers are sort of the leftover. So when we're doing our categorization, we know that these aren't conformers, these three. We know that these two are enantiomers, but this one is not a mirror image, so he must be a diastereomer. And so this one here is actually a diastereomer of both of those other two. Hopefully they found that a little bit of fun, a little bit different from looking at molecular models. Hopefully it also helps you remember some of those terms that can get really confusing because they're so similar. Constitutional versus conformational versus configurational and so on. If you want to have a reference for this, then I've got a PDF just down below the video here. You can download that and it has the Lego minifigure pictures next to each of the terms. So hopefully that can refresh your memory about some of these terms. Good luck with stereochemistry and good luck with isomers. <laughs>